I'd like to introduce Steve Goss, composer and guitarist, and we're going to ask him a few questions about his, his uh, composition, The Uneasy Dreams and Other Issues. Uh, sure. Steve, in your saxophone quartet, Uneasy Dreams, you base each movement on one of Terry uh, Gilliam's films. Mm. Why did you take this approach and how did you do that? Uh, I think whenever I write a piece, I like to have some kind of stimulus starting point. Um, something that's already pre-existing that kind of interests me. Essentially, uh, there are two things I really like about writing the piece. One is doing all the research beforehand, uh, and the other is working with the performers at the end. Uh, all that unpleasant stuff, putting notes on paper in between, is, is my least favourite part. So, with this piece, I thought a good way to start uh, researching a film would be to watch some Terry Gilliam films again. Uh, some of them are my kind of favourite uh, films, enjoy them very much, but in particular the kind of fantasy sequences in the films where he just takes things totally out of the ordinary and, and makes things appear very, very different from the norm so that uh, you're looking at an object and suddenly you're not sure, is it meant to be real, is it a dream, is it a fantasy? And I kind of like that aspect uh, in music too, where you start off by listening to something and before your very ears things transform and change, you're not quite sure what it is you're listening to anymore. So how do you kind of directly take a particular scene from a film and use that within the, the movements? Because I know the titles of the movements relate to specific... They do, films. yeah. There are, there are three films uh, referred to in the, in, the, in the piece. The first one, Tideland, which is a very strange, dark film. Uh, the second one is called A Blues for Sam Lowry. Sam Lowry is a character from the film Brazil. And the final one is called The Fisher King from the film The Fisher King. Um, the first one, Tideland, tries to recreate a scene from the film, or a couple of scenes from the film, uh, fantasy sequences. Uh, sort of swimming underwater and uh, all these kinds of bizarre images. It, it's based around this young girl. It's a kind of cross between, the film is a cross between Alice in Wonderland and uh, Psycho. It's kind of slightly disturbing, very unusual. And this poor disturbed girl has kind of a weird perception of reality. She lives in the middle of the plains, and yet she sort of imagines uh, water around the place and sort of swimming under underwater and going on missions with a submarine. And there are these wonderful sort of fantasy sequences in the film, and it was that I wanted to kind of recreate those in the music I was doing. So in that first movement, it really does try and recreate the scenes from the films in a sort of musical form. Um, and the second one, the Sam Lowry one, I think it's much more about trying to portray a character, a particular kind of melancholic, downtrodden uh, character. And then the last one really is more about uh, a kind of mood, an overall kind of calm, um, uh, calm mood, really. So the, the narrative of the first is, it, it's, is the most, most important aspect. The, the first um, has a sort of narrative structure to it. The first. Yeah, I mean, I think narrative in music is a very interesting in concept because often it, it's, it's sort of bolted straight onto the idea of a story, or in, from A to B to C. And yet I think a narrative can also go from types of music to types of other music and, and move in that way. So that rather than having sort of unconnected um, movements, if you like, you've got something, a sequence of mood changes. And certainly, I mean, this piece, Uneasy Dreams, is a very good example of that. It starts very uneasy, very nervous, very kind of um, uh, unsettled. Then it goes into this kind of gloomy melancholy, uh, sort of blues. And then finally everything just kind of comes out in the wash, very calm, very still, very peaceful. So there's very much a kind of narrative journey, journey of, of mood types rather than a story per se. I think. Do you see the three movements as, as almost joined, or are they? do you see yeah. them as separate portraits? Um, well, they're certainly physically joined in terms of the music. The music doesn't stop. Uh, and what interests me, I think, most about uh, this piece and, and other more recent pieces is this whole idea of transition. Transition, the kind of in-between, moving from one section to another. Uh, I think some of the most sort of impressive moments of particularly sort of 19th and 20th century orchestral music of transitions, how a composer manages to do them. There's one which, uh, for example, in Sibelius' Fifth Symphony between the first movement and this kind of scherzo, there's this incredible transition and the magic of the piece is how he gets from A to B. Not the A, not the B, but what goes on in between and how suddenly one is, now suddenly the other, this kind of metamorphosis that's kind of really sort of fascinating. So it's that, it's that when music changes from one thing to another that's, that's kind of interesting. In this piece, the, the changes are relatively quick and straightforward-ish, but it's still that, that change that's interesting. 
Why did you decide to write for Saxophone Quartet? Um, because Chris Caldwell asked me for a piece. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, yeah, I mean, basically everything I write is, is to commission. Um, and it's kind of, it always comes from outside. Uh, Chris had wanted a piece for a while, and we just sort of sat down and talked about it. We found an opportunity, uh, which meant there was some funding, so uh, the piece came into being. Um, and it was interesting at the time, because he said to me, he said, um, most of our pieces are loud and fast and rhythmic and punchy. And I was thinking, yeah, that's the kind of piece I want to write, yeah, great, <laughs> saxophone quartet. Mm. Uh, and he said, how about something seven minutes long, slow and quiet? I said, oh, all right. <laughs> was, uh, so he was very specific about the length and about the kind of piece it was, imagining certain programs to put it in. But funnily enough, as it turns out, uh, it's appeared in a couple of programs with lots of other slow and quiet pieces, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, it was, uh, it was from, from Chris Colbert and the group. Is it usual for commissioners to say you know, what kind of music they want? Well, in a way, sort of detail? Yeah, I mean, I prefer it. Uh, I would be much rather given very specific... Uh, guidelines as to what to do. Uh, there's nothing more daunting than someone saying, okay, write whatever you like. As long as you like, hard as you like, whatever. I like it. I like to see how the piece fits into a particular program. Nearly everyone I write for, um, they play concerts that have mostly non-contemporary pieces in them. So my piece will be the only contemporary piece. And I kind of like to know what the pieces are that are going to be around it, how it'll sort of fit into that context and how it'll fit into that person's show or that group show the orchestra show. Slightly different with the Delta Quartet because they play a lot of new music. So, mm -hmm. so in, in a sense, mine is the, the oasis of calm in amongst all this kind of high energy stuff. Whereas in other contexts, it might be that my piece is a slightly more uh, jarry one uh, in, con in context of what it's around it. I'm, I think I'm very interested in those kind of performance contexts. Uh, how, what comes before the piece, what comes after it, what sort of audience is going to be there and what sort of tour it's, it's part of. Presumably your piece would still work in a, in a different sort of context. Oh, absolutely. So I mean, the, but the thing is that like, you can't second guess um, later contexts. I mean, I always write the piece for the person who's commissioned it, sometimes very, very specifically geared at their play, very much for the first run of concerts, first recording or whatever. Uh, pieces are often played later by other people. And that's kind of interesting because uh, they're not who it was conceived for. And that kind of exciting collaborative process that went between when I started writing the piece to when uh, the piece was performed, recorded or whatever. That for me is the exciting part, where change is possible and things are moving around. And once you've kind of reached that point and it's passed on to another group, another person, then there's a certain amount of uh, fixity and finishedness about it. Um, and while I, you know, I'd still recognise it as my, my own pieces, for me the excitement comes in that initial period of, um, of collaboration. Were you thinking about the particular players from the Delta when you were writing a part, or were you...? Yeah, yeah, yeah very much so. I mean, when uh, the personal has changed slightly since the, the piece was written, uh, in fact, between the first performance and the recording, um, the membership changed slightly. But uh, one player, Pete Wyman in particular, uh, very much had in mind his kind of high screaming soprano sax stuff that he does so brilliantly. Uh, and also, uh, you know, a couple of other members of the group, particularly Chris on the, on the baritone sax, there's a particular sort of sound quality that I really wanted to exploit. Yeah. Yeah. Did you consult with them at all during the process or did you just go away, get on with it and then give it to them? Yeah, I mean, um, I left, I basically wrote the piece and handed it over, but uh, the first moment I left very loose in terms of uh, I have an idea, that there were some improvised bits, some bits which I wanted to experiment with certain kinds of sounds. And I wanted to do that with them in the room and to kind of experiment, say, so, well, let's try this, let's try that. The second two movements were very much fixed. Well, you know, I changed one or two things in the rehearsal process. Um, one or two suggestions came from them and the piece kind of settled down, uh, was performed. And then when we came to record it, we just worked on more, more kind of subtle details, gradations of colour, bits of rubato and so on. But by the time it was recorded, it was pretty much um, the finished object, yeah. Were there any particular issues that you found in writing with the sax quartet? Any things that you don't have in other contexts? Yeah, I mean, uh, you mentioned earlier I'm a guitarist. And as a result of having been a guitarist, well, I still am a guitarist. I've written a lot of guitar music and a lot of music for guitar plus instrument. Uh, and also, so happens, I've written a lot of piano music, piano chain music. Um, 
But what was interesting with the sax piece was this idea of having sustained sounds, just sort of spread out, lovely sustained sounds, and also these kind of half tones and colours and things. So for me, uh, the exciting thing about this commission was just being able to draw long sounds out. So particularly the last room, which is all about very quiet, very still, or very drawn out, sustained sounds. It was a luxury um, not to have to rely on sort of percussive instruments. Um, so that was that was a kind of um, a nice aspect to it. I mean, I, the combination of the four together, you, you do sort of worry about sort of colour issues. I think that's one of the things I wanted to kind of um, think about and how I could have a wide range of colours within within a relatively short space. So again, the contrast between character, mood, and so on, also the the colour thing is important. To how far would you say that the material in each of the three sections movements are related? I mean, certainly when you listen to it, sound, that you can hear links between all three. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, there are various different sort of levels happening in terms of the, the sorts of material I'm using. Um, all three movements are based on sort of pre-existing music in some way or another. Uh, normally what I'm doing is is creating a harmonic template. This is what I do in quite a number of pieces. Similar to sort of a jazz chord sequence, if you like. But these chords might be seven, eight note chords. Um, they might be two or three note chords. They might sort of move towards a very sort of thick, saturated sound and away from it again. Uh, they might be very distant chords or very tonal chords. But for me, the excitement is coming up with a really interesting sequence of these chords or keys, uh, which I come up with entirely separate from the compositional process the nitty-gritty of who plays what where. So I end up with this kind of, if you like, a harmonic template behind it all. And then uh, I work my way through the harmonic template with the instruments. Uh, and the chords will change where I feel they need to change or not. Sometimes I decide in advance how long each chord is going to last roughly. Um, it could have a very slow harmonic motion, so a chord could change every minute or two. Or it could be very, very fast and it could be changing every bar. So these are kind of variables that I like to, to play with. Uh, but then the sort of playing with the notes on, on the surface, the detail, is where the real fun of the improvisation takes place. And you know that at this particular passage you've got these eight different pitches to play with or six different pitches to play with. And then it's a question of being as inventive as you possibly can with it and making links between that and the next chord. So I think issues of sort of voice leading um, from my classical training are still very much at the, at the root of what's going on. Is jazz something which has had an impact on... Because some yeah. of your music certainly seems to have a... You know, jazz-tinged harmonies. Yeah, I'm certainly very interested in um, in jazz. I'm nothing of an improviser. I can't. I'm not. Uh, uh, I haven't had the training uh, or spent the time doing it. But I do listen to a lot of jazz music, and I do enjoy uh, the harmonic um, uh, games that they play. And if I, you know, harmonically, I find, for example, the music of Michael Brecker very, very interesting, where you have a sort of uh, chord sequence going down at the bottom. And then superimposed on top of that, he's doing his own thing in his own imagined chord and sequence that's sort of slightly different from what's going on beneath. There's all this amazing sophistication going on in these, uh, in these pieces. Uh, they're incredibly sort of rhythmically and improvisationally complex and, and kind of rich. So I do enjoy uh, yeah, listening to a lot of that kind of thing, really. Uh, particularly sort of guitarists like Pat Metheny, John McLaughlin, mm -hmm. these sorts of people. Yeah. That's great. What I'd like to do is now perhaps move on to... Uh, another piece of yours which uh, fascinated me, which is Frozen Music. It was written in 2005 for guitar, violin, viola and cello for the Menuhin School. Mm. And uh, these are a set of pieces based on specific pieces of architecture. Mm. So, so how do you do that? How do you compose <laughs> a, a piece using architectural principles? Yeah. Um, well, probably the, the most clear example is... Um, the movement that's based on Ronchon Chapel, which is the beautiful chapel that Le Corbusier built in, uh, in France, uh, using his principle of modular architecture, which is to do with the proportions of the different sizes of the body. Um, so you have various sort of figures that relate sort of, if you like, arm length, knee length, head, heart, these kinds of ratios. And then those ratios are blown up big into the size of the, of the chapel itself. So he's using the same ratios. And all I did in terms of uh, adapting that to music was to use the same you know, same ratios in terms of time. So that, if you like, the, the sort of model of the body that he has for the modular architecture, I sort of lay on its side, so that these figures then became lengths of beats or lengths of 
seconds or, or whatever, so that the form was very strictly um, predetermined. And then it was a question of me filling that form with, with different kinds of music. And in that piece, I had the kind of guitar as interludes, uh, doing a sort of bell-like figure, and then the strings in between doing a sort of chorale thing to kind of keep it into the chapel sort of idea. But with some of the other movements, there's one movement based on the um, Arsenal Stadium in London. Um, in fact, Highbury, the one that they were moving out of that season, it's the last season there. And so I chose all sorts of sort of musical samples from the times uh, when the stadium was built in the 30s. Um, and also used some of the sort of numbers and things from the years in which Arsenal had won the league championship and all this kind of uh, sort of hidden stuff. Um, and that was great fun to do. Do you find sort of using uh, pre-organised uh, structures helpful? In the yeah, I mean, I don't always do it. I think what's interesting about pre-organised structures is that they, um, they set you a challenge. You know, you've only got this amount of time to do this, this thing. Uh, so it's got to happen within that space, that time space. I mean, it's something I think I'm really fascinated by the music of Berg and just the idea of uh, predetermining, okay, this event will happen at this point, even though you've got blank manuscript paper before it, blank manuscript paper after it. But you know when these key things are going to happen. And that's kind of fascinating, the idea that it's kind of mapped out and you're just there fleshing the whole time, rather than feeling that you're entering a sort of dark tunnel that's never ending. <laughs> Um, that there's always a question in moving towards particular points. And I think, you know, my music is very traditional in the sense that it does move from A to B and it's about this kind of travelling, I think. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Steve. Pleasure. That's great.